Our next sponsor is Podcorn. Podcorn is a marketplace that connects podcasters with great sponsorship opportunities like host read ads, interview segments, topical discussions and more. Podcorn takes out the middleman so podcasters of all levels have a chance to monetize their podcast, setting their own rates and having full control over their collaborations. We started using Podcorn a few months ago and it's already changed the game. We can actually make some money from podcasting which means we can put more time into doing what we love and trying to produce quality content. I found the site so easy to use, podcorn.com. You'll find the link in our show notes. It really is easy to navigate and you can view loads of different sponsorship opportunities right there on your screen. It couldn't be easier to pitch a proposal to a brand to work with them on a campaign. Podcorn makes sure podcasters are able to keep their creative freedom and have full control over how and when we monetize. They also have automated payment, which means you get your money as soon as you've submitted your work. If you're a fellow podcast host, definitely check out their site, podcorn.com. It's stereo eyes. I just tried to stop the bleeding really and comfort him as much as I could. Welcome to Crime Laps. I am Eileen. And I'm Charlie. Today's case shook the nation. This is Road Rage, the murder of Lee Harvey. On December 1st, 1996, a couple were driving home after a night at the pub. The driver, Lee Harvey, was found, stabbed over 30 times beside his car. His fiancée, Tracy, was beaten and bloodied, holding him when a witness called 999. The murder was a suspected road rage incident. Tracy publicly appealed for the driver of the other car to come forward. The nation were stunned. They feared a killer walked among them, and they were right. On the night of December 1st, 1996, the police were called to Cooper's Hill near Gloucester, England. At the scene, they found the body of Lee Harvey. His fiance Tracy was bloodied and battered. The police were told that the couple had been out for a drink and were on their way home. On the journey, Lee had overtaken a dark-coloured Ford Sierra. Lee was driving a white Ford Escort RS Turbo 2000, and after the manoeuvre, a chase ensued. The Ford Sierra tailed the couple's car, flashing its headlights and gesturing for them to pull over at the side of the road. The dark-coloured Sierra then overtook Lee and Tracy's car, forcing them to pull over in front of a house on Cooper's Lane. Lee got out of the car and began arguing with the other driver. After exchanging some heated words, the driver of the Sierra returned his car. As Lee started to make his way back to his car, a passenger got out of the dark-coloured Sierra. The passenger suddenly lunged at Lee and began assaulting him. Tracy tried to intervene when she saw her fiancé being attacked. She was hit in the face by the passenger who she described as being a white male, aged around 25, 5 foot 6 and very overweight. Both the driver and the attacker were described as having Birmingham accents. Tracy sustained a head injury and was brought to hospital for treatment. She required stitches above her eyebrow. The murderer and the weapons were nowhere to be found. Lee had been stabbed over 35 times. At a press conference a couple of days later, Tracy sat in front of a packed room of journalists and photographers, flanked by Lee's parents who held her hand as she spoke about what happened. She said it started when Lee overtook a battered Ford Sierra as they drove home from a pub in Barnesgrove, not far from their house. Tracy said she was frightened and asked Lee to ignore the other car and just pull over but Lee didn't like anyone telling them how to drive. She recounted how the car had chased them at speeds of up to 60 miles per hour along country lanes before they were forced to stop. Both me and the other person were playing cat and mouse with each other for a while. Um, And they overtook us. I was shouting at Lee to slow down, just ignore them, stop the car, but he... I don't know. I don't know if a lot of men are like it, and a lot of women are like it. But um, you get behind the wheel of a car. You know, sometimes you change personality. Lee got out of the car and began arguing with the driver. The driver was shouting racist remarks at Lee, and as Lee turned around to get back into the car, the passenger got out of the dark-coloured Sierra. 
Tracy described the passenger as a large man with staring eyes. It was just the way he looked. He was, his eyes was he had stary eyes. Um, he just didn't seem normal. Tracy said she saw the passenger hit Lee with something. She got out of the car to confront the man who then assaulted her and knocked her to the ground. When she got up, the passenger was walking back to the car and Lee was bleeding on the ground. I saw the man hit Lee. I don't know what with. I didn't see anything. I got out of the car because I'm not the sort of person to sit there. I got out of the car and I came round the back of the car and, um, and then I went over to the uh, man. We had a confrontation. He hit me. I can't remember. I fell to the floor. I can't remember if I was um, knocked out for a bit of what I don't know. When Tracy went to where Lee was lying, she tried to administer first aid and stop the bleeding, but there was nothing she could do. Lee died in her arms. I was on the first aid course when I was little. Um, I was trying to think of everything that I could do. Um, put my coat over him and I didn't move him. And uh, I just tried to stop the bleeding, really, and comfort him as much as I could. Tracy appealed for the driver of the other car to come forward, saying that she knew it wasn't their fault and that they wouldn't get into any trouble. The lives of Lee's loved ones had been turned upside down. The uh, driver uh, walked off. It was nothing to do with the driver. And all I want to say is, please, will the driver of the car just come forward because you are not to blame for this. And I know that. Whoever this person is that was with you, you obviously know him. But he's ruined my life. He's ruined the life of Maureen and Ray and Michelle, Lee's sister, and these little girls on the Please just tell us who he is because you won't get in any trouble at all. It was not your fault. In the run up to Christmas, people were shocked to hear that something so horrifying could be a random attack. They feared for their lives. Who would randomly kill a young father and attack a young woman? Police were out in force looking for the Ford Sierra. They set up roadblocks and appealed for witnesses to come forward, but there were no leads. The public were outraged and they couldn't help but feel for Lee's grieving fiance. Tracy's photograph was on the cover of most newspapers. The photo was a world away from the usual glamour shot she posed in. On December 7th, people were heartbroken to hear that Tracy had attempted to take her own life. While in her mother's house, Tracy had taken a lethal cocktail of paracetamol, tranquilizers, and aspirin. She left two farewell letters, saying goodbye to her little girl. She was rushed to hospital and was in critical condition, but she survived. When she awoke, Lee's family were by her side. Lee Harvey's mother recalls Tracy, still heavily sedated and groggy from her overdose, taking her hand and saying, quote, I'm so sorry for what I've done, unquote. On the night Lee died, his mother was woken up to the sound of a car pulling into the garden. She presumed it was Lee coming back, bags in hand after yet another big argument with his fiance. It wasn't unusual for him to turn up in the middle of the night, especially after a night of drink fueled arguing. The Harveys were never sure of Tracy and Lee's relationship. They assumed it was more likely lust than love. But when she didn't hear his key turn in the door, she looked out the window and saw there was a police car in the driveway, not her son. She woke her husband, Ray, and they rushed downstairs. At the door were two police officers. The officers asked the Harveys if they were Lee's parents. Her husband nodded to confirm that they were. As the officers came into the house, one said, quote, I'm afraid he's been in some sort of row. A road rage attack, he's been stabbed. Unquote. Overcome with shock and disbelief, Maureen, Lee's mother, asked, quote, Is he alright? As the officers began to apologise, Maureen collapsed with grief into the arms of a female officer. The Harveys couldn't believe their son was killed. They were stunned and questioned if the officers were sure. Then they asked about Tracy. They were told that Tracy had been injured in the attack and was being treated in a hospital in Redditch. 
Lee's dad, Ray, demanded to know how Tracy had survived if Lee had been murdered. Why would the killer leave a witness? Why didn't she phone them? Questions that, at this point, no one had answers to. We just want to take a moment to talk about our sponsor of this episode, Best Fiends. True crime can get a little bit heavy. We all need a bit of downtime. I play my new favourite mobile puzzle game, Best Fiends. Best Fiends updates the game monthly with new levels and mini challenges, so it never gets old, and no matter how fast you are, you will not run out of levels easily. Best Fiends treats the game like a service for their players. I find it's a handy distraction when I'm waiting for the kettle to boil or for the baby to fall asleep. You can even play it without Wi-Fi, so it's perfect for on the go without using your data. It's engaging and fun. I like to play it in the evenings. It helps me wind down before I go to bed. It's fast-paced and the levels don't take too long to complete, so you can pick it up and put it down whenever you like. You can collect different bugs and they all have different skills, so you can use them tactically to defeat the slugs. Engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters. Trust me, with over 100 million downloads, this 5-star rated mobile puzzle game is a must-play. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the or. Best Fiends. This episode is sponsored by Atomic Child. Do you love the outdoors and wish that you had a way to keep it with you throughout your week, especially while most of us are holed up at home? Atomic Child is an artist-run brand that is inspired by nature. They capture the great outdoors through unique designs. Their designs can be found on stickers, blankets, water bottles, mugs, pins, patches and more at AtomicChild.com. We bring nature to you. Lee and Tracy had first met in a nightclub in 1994. They would say it was love at first sight. Lee was a good-looking single dad who was a bit of a ladies' man. He was a hard worker and was well-liked. Tracy was a single mother. They both had daughters of a similar age. Within three months, they were living together. Not long after, the cracks started to show in their new relationship. They were both jealous of each other's exes. And with children involved, there would always be an ex around. They would have massive arguments, often violent, usually ending in Lee either being thrown out by Tracy or she would have to call the police to get him to leave. When he would go, he went to his mother's. He would have his clothes packed in bags and his face would be covered in scratches. After a few days, Tracy would call him in tears and he would run back to her. People have said that they liked making up more than anything else. The physical attraction between them was intense. Tracy had always been intense. She was the type of woman that made people feel intimidated. Many felt like they were walking on eggshells around her, out of fear she would blow up without any prior notice. Tracy was born and raised in Hereford and Worcester. She had a sister, a brother and many half-siblings. Her parents' relationship ended when she was young. There were often blazing rows in the home as Tracy grew up, and it's likely that her insecurities began to manifest when her father walked out. She was just eight years old. Tracy went from having a nuclear family to living without the constant presence of a father figure, all the stability she once had. Tracy had aspirations of becoming a glamour model. She had done some small basic shoots for different companies, modelling hair extensions, but nothing came of it. She was insecure and sought out male attention. She considered becoming a nurse but ended up selling perfume, makeup and hair products. When Tracy was 21, she found out she was pregnant with her then boyfriend, Andrew Tilston. Their relationship didn't last long and she ended up moving home with her parents before moving into a council flat back in Alvechurch. Andrew, the father of her daughter Carla, said that Tracy had threatened him with a knife before. He also allegedly warned Lee to never turn his back on Tracy during a fight. Tracy and Lee would have explosive rows. The police were often called and it was seen as a regular domestic dispute. They had good times too though. They took their daughters on holiday, they enjoyed nights out together, but there was never that much time before the next spat. It was no secret that Tracy and Lee had a turbulent relationship. They were often seen arguing and Tracy made no effort to hide her emotions, especially when she was angry. An example of this 
was after Lee and Tracy got engaged. Lee had told his friends and family he planned to propose to Tracy. Despite their constant arguing and the jealousy that was fueling it, he felt as though the gesture would calm Tracy down and prove to her that he wanted only her. They had planned to announce their engagement at a family barbecue at Lee's house one weekend. As they were enjoying the day, Lee's sister shared some happy news that she was getting engaged to her partner. Tracy Andrews was livid. She felt as though her spotlight had been snatched away, so in front of Lee's entire family, she stormed off and started shouting. She was furious that Michelle had announced her engagement before she'd had a chance to. Tracy called Michelle a cow and forbid Lee from attending his own sister's wedding. Lee obeyed. On the morning of the wedding months later in May, Lee dropped off a gift, kissed his sister on her big day, but confirmed that he wouldn't be in attendance. Later that summer, Lee and Tracy had another out. Lee came back to his mother's house, and this time he was sure he wasn't going back. Tracy called a few days later. She was pregnant. Lee was ecstatic, just as he had been when his daughter's mother Anita fell pregnant years before. He loved being a father, and he was a great dad. Even when his relationship with Anita ended, they remained close for their daughter Danielle's sake. Lee was determined to fix things with Tracy. He was still living at home so that the pressure on their relationship wasn't as intense. Then Tracy lost the baby. Lee was heartbroken. She had fallen down some steps and miscarried at four months. Like any decent guy would, he rushed to be by her side. Not long after, things went back to how they had been before. Two months before Lee was killed, the couple had a blazing row in Baker's, a nightclub in Birmingham City Centre. They were shouting at each other, and Tracy bit Lee, breaking the skin. She was punching him in the face and demanding to know who he was at the club with. A barmaid at the nightclub later testified in court to say that Lee never retaliated, and even went to the bar to get Tracy a drink after she'd ordered him to. After her attempted overdose, Tracy was in the hospital. She said she couldn't live without Lee and that's why she tried to kill herself. The search for the road rage killer was coming up empty. Detectives were starting to get sceptical of her account of what happened the night Lee was killed. Despite massive appeals, roadblocks and interviews, no one saw a dark coloured Sierra chasing Lee's Ford Escort. A couple who had been driving in the same area did see Lee's car just before he was killed, but could not confirm that there was another car following them. The first witness at the scene of the killing did not remember Tracy mentioning a car following them until another person came out. Tracy had said the other car pulled in in front of them and forced them to pull in. According to her statement, Lee got out of the car and walked to the front where he argued with the other driver. As he was walking back towards Tracy, he was attacked by a, quote, fat man with staring eyes, unquote. The forensic evidence showed blood found at the back of Lee's car, not the front. Lee had been stabbed 42 times. The fatal wound was in his neck. The knife severed his carotid artery, and he would have bled out very quickly. A clump of Tracy's hair, about 80 to 100 strands, pulled out at the roots, had also been found near Lee's hand at the murder scene. More hair was stuck between his thumb and forefinger, suggesting that he had pulled her hair either to hurt her or to stop her hurting him. As well as the forensic evidence that didn't line up with Tracy's version of events, the story itself made her seem suspicious. The day she was released from hospital after her failed suicide attempt, she was arrested on suspicion of murder. Tracy was placed in a psychiatric facility under police guard for 11 days, then released and questioned by police before being charged with the murder of Lee Harvey on December 19th. Two days after Lee was killed, Tracy sat in front of news reporters and TV crews and cried for her lost fiancé. Her face was bruised and her hair was still stained with blood. The noise of the camera shutters didn't drown out her retelling of what happened on the night Lee died. The contrast between her glamour shots and the photos taken that day are startling. She sat holding Lee's mother's hand and lied to the world. She fabricated a story of a fat, racist, random attacker and sent the police on a wild goose chase. In an episode of the Investigation Discovery show Faking It, Tears of a Crime, body language expert Cliff Lanzi explains how Tracy gave away six signs of deception simply by saying the sentence, quote, I just tried to stop the bleeding, really, unquote. The word really indicates she's lying. 
If that actually happened, she would not have needed to add that word. She slightly shrugs or raises her shoulder when she's speaking. This can be involuntary and it's a sign that you aren't sure about what you're saying. She drops the volume of her voice, then swallows hard, pauses and raises the pitch of her voice again. This is an indication that she was trying to elicit sympathy. She also messes up her story. She was asked what time they left the pub and says the following. In hindsight, it's obvious she's lying, and she continues to lie. Tracy stuck with her story even though the evidence was damning. She protested her innocence, and she was released on bail just before Christmas. Tracy spent the holidays with her family, and Lee's family spent them grieving. Tracy's solicitors were building their defence while the Harveys were preparing to bury their son. Lee's funeral was held on February 7th, and over 350 people attended. Tracy Andrews was not allowed to attend. Tracy told her story again, how her and Lee had been chased by a car, and the passenger had gotten out and attacked Lee, shouting racist remarks. No evidence corroborated Tracy's tale. There was no proof another car had even been there at the time Tracy and Lee had pulled in. Lee's blood was found behind the car, not at the front, as Tracy had claimed. There was also a witness, a young girl who lived in a house near the murder scene. She recalled hearing an argument that night. She only heard two voices, a man and what sounded like a woman. The prosecution had already told the court about the history of domestic violence in Tracy and Lee's relationship, including incidences where Tracy had bitten, punched and hit Lee with a bottle. They were also told about how she pulled a knife on her ex. Witnesses from the pub Tracy and Lee had been drinking in the night of his murder spoke of how they barely spoke and how there was clear, quote, animosity, unquote, between them. On the 30th of June, 1997, she pleaded not guilty to the murder of Lee Harvey. The trial went on for almost a month. On the 2nd of July, the trial took place in Birmingham Crown Court. Prosecutor David Krigman told the jury that Tracy and Lee had been arguing as they drove the five miles home when Tracy stabbed Lee between 35 and 42 times in the back, neck, head and chest. Forensic testing indicated that the knife used was a pen knife. There had been small puncture wounds under the stab wounds probably made by another tool on a Swiss army knife that pierced the skin as Lee was being stabbed. Lee was known to keep a Swiss army knife he had gotten on holidays in his car. A bloody imprint found in the inside of Tracy Andrews' boot looked just like an outline of that type of weapon. Prosecutors believed that Tracy had killed Lee, then hid the knife in her boot, disposing of it when she got to the hospital. The first witness, Richard Main, had been visiting his friend, ex-police officer Susan Duncan, when he heard a woman screaming. He told Susan Duncan to call an ambulance and ran back to Tracy who was on the roadside holding Lee. She didn't mention anything about a road rage attack until Mrs Duncan came out and then she was saying, quote, I told him not to get out of the car, unquote. There was blood spatter consistent with arterial spray on Tracy Andrews' top. If she had been inside the car during the attack or on the ground unable to get to Lee, she would not have those blood stains unless she had been standing right beside him, as an injury of this type would bleed out in just 60 seconds. Their neighbours had heard them arguing the day Lee was killed, and witnesses saw Lee's escort and confirmed it was not being followed. There were no other cars for miles. As Tracy was cross-examined and accused of killing Lee in a rage, she said, quote, I am not going to admit to anything I have not done, unquote. But when questioned further, Tracy, who had always had trouble keeping her mouth shut, was, for once, at a loss for words. Tracy's tune didn't change throughout the trial. She denied killing Lee. She admitted their relationship was stormy, but she said that she loved Lee and she would never kill him. At the beginning of the trial, she gestured towards where Lee's family were sitting in the gallery and said she wanted to be sitting where they were, trying to get justice for Lee. But at another stage, she demanded Lee's mother was removed from the court 
a flash of rage, just enough to show the jury the unprovoked anger Tracy was capable of. As with the press conference, this outburst was quickly stifled and her character was resumed. After deliberating for two days, the jury found Tracy Andrews guilty of murder. She was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 14 years to be served. She appealed her conviction the following October, citing that the jury had been biased against her after all the media coverage, but this was rejected. Six months later, Tracy finally confessed. Well, at least partially. In April 1998, a letter was published by the News of the World. It was a letter Tracy had written to a friend. Apparently, Lee and Tracy had argued over Tracy's ex while they were in the pub that night. On the drive home, they argued and Tracy told Lee to stop the car because she didn't want to be in it with him. She began walking home, but Lee pulled in further ahead and was waiting for her. She said that Lee started accusing her of sleeping around and threatened to slash her face. Somehow, Tracy got the knife from Lee. She then goes on to say how she saw Red. Here are some extracts from that letter the News of the World published. Quote, I just went mad. Everything went like slow motion. I was shaking and had lost all control. All the abuse I had suffered and all the nasty things that had been thrown in my face. I have never ever in my whole life lost control like I did this night. Unquote. She continues talking about how she tried to cover her tracks and that she did flush the knife down the toilet in the hospital that night. She blamed Lee. The question is posed, why would Tracy wait two years to even entertain the idea of a self-defence plea? She could have gotten a lesser sentence if it had been self-defence. She panicked at the scene of the crime, and then she was thrust before the media and found herself too deep in the lie to back out. Tracy Andrews still pops up in red top newspapers now and then. She is a great source for gossip and is considered a spectacle. Her once jutting lower jaw was surgically corrected under the NHS while she was behind bars. Her long blonde hair was cut short and dyed black. She changed her name, but she's never far from public attention. Tracy Andrews was released from prison in 2011. She goes by a new name and lives with her husband in a town in South England. Stories vary from lesbian encounters in prison, stealing someone else's husband and most recently her marriage. At her hen party she was dressed as a police officer. She is still in contact with her daughter but she is banned from going near the Harveys. Lee's family have never received an apology. His mum wrote a book published in 2008 about the tragedy. It is called Pure Evil. How Tracy Andrews murdered my son, deceived the nation and sentenced me to a life of pain and misery. Lee's mum says in her book, quote, One of my last memories of Lee had been of him dancing to loud music as he was trying to shave and eat a sandwich at the same time. There never seemed to be enough time in the day for him. Perhaps he'd known he didn't have long in this life. Unquote. Tracy and Lee had a toxic relationship. Tracy had made herself look even more guilty while trying to prove her innocence. She concocted a story to try and mask her inner rage. She needed to be the centre of attention and the centre of Lee's world. If she wasn't, no one could be. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you've liked it, please leave us a five-star review on Apple or Stitcher or wherever you leave your reviews and you listen to your podcasts. It really helps us out. And if you feel like it, become a patron. You can follow us on social media at Crime Labs and at Crime Labs Pod. Until then, stay safe, stay home. Hello, this is Eric Carter Landine, the host and producer of True Consequences, a true crime and mystery podcast with stories based in New Mexico and the American Desert Southwest. We'll uncover cases such as the Toy Box Killer, one of the worst serial rapists and suspected serial killers in New Mexico's history. We will also discuss mysteries such as alien sightings, as well as hauntings and other weird things that happen in this area of the country. I hope you'll give me a chance and listen to True Consequences. I think you might enjoy it. You can find us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts.